I invite you to turn to the Gospel of Luke, the seventh chapter, beginning with the first verse. And because it is a gospel reading, out of respect, will you stand for our Lord? Hear this, the Word of God. After Jesus had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. A centurion there had a slave whom he valued highly and who was ill and close to death. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to him, asking him to come and heal his slave. When they came to Jesus, they appealed to him earnestly, saying, He is worthy of having you do this for him, for he loves our people, and it is he who built our synagogue for us. And Jesus went with them, but when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but only speak the word and let my servant be healed. For I also am a man set under authority with soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and the slave does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd and that followed him, he said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. By and large, the story of Jesus and the centurion is read as a story about the nature of faith. Here's a guy with so much faith in Jesus' ability to heal that he sends others to tell Jesus, just say the word. That's right, he tells Jesus not to even bother showing up, but to simply give the command. He's a centurion. He's a centurion. He knows what authority is all about. And he believes that Jesus has authority. He is not only a centurion, he is perhaps the most unlikely person in whom others would expect to find faith. In that day, most folks, and particularly Jewish religious leaders, didn't typically look to Roman centurions for examples of piety. Beyond being unlikely, he is also, and this may be even more important, unexpected. Not even Jesus was expecting to hear how much confidence this centurion had in him. Luke describes Jesus as being amazed. Not even in Israel have I found such faith. As a military officer, the centurion knew about raw force. He knew how well swords and masses of trained men could dish out unimaginable carnage, leaving massive destruction in their wake. He knew power. But in Jesus, he recognized a different kind of power. He recognized military might would not heal his servant. All the soldiers and all the swords would not heal his servant. The centurion recognized in Jesus a power unlike any power wielded by Rome or any other empire. He recognized in Jesus a power that heals peoples and communities that brings the powerful down from their thrones, that exalts the unlikely and the unexpected, that turns the world upside down and inside out, that, un 
unlikely centurion would recognize this power is the very essence of faith. That he would choose to see the world with God's eyes. That he would see the possibilities of a world renewed by God's love and favor is the epitome of faith. What a surprise. In God's creative wisdom, God regularly shows up where we don't expect and in the most unlikely people. Would you agree? But I suspect that Jesus wasn't the only one who was amazed. If you fast forward from this event uh, 30 to 40 years into the future, and the unlikeliness and unexpectedness was still very real. It was still very real because one thing had not changed in all that time. And the one thing that was very much still the same is that Rome was still in charge. There was still an occupying force in Israel. Still enforcing its will upon Israelites of all ranks and stations. Which means this centurion was one of the people directly responsible for the oppression of the people. Through the eyes of the Jews, he was the last one they expected to exhibit such faith. He was an extension of Rome, a brutal enemy of the people. My hunch is the centurion's unexpected and surprising confession of faith quickly became the topic of discussion there in that community, much like it would today. But should it have been a surprise? A closer look at the centurion's life would suggest it really shouldn't have. The scriptures tell us that he was well acquainted with the Jewish leaders. As a matter of fact, he sent Jewish leaders to talk to Jesus. He was commended by the Jewish leaders to Jesus. He's worthy of your help. So it really shouldn't have come as a great surprise that he was asking for Jesus on behalf of his servant. All of which means the Gentile commander is more complex than people perhaps in his day or even ours would make him out to be. On the one hand, he's a Roman centurion through and through. And on the other hand, he's a man that does good in his community. On the one hand, he's part of the occupying forces oppressing Israel. And on the other hand, he builds synagogues for the people under his authority. This passage reminds us that we should never reduce someone to one attribute or judge someone based on one element of who they are. In a recent homily, Pope Francis, whose theology is taking the world by storm, said, not only are all people redeemed by Christ's sacrifice, all people are capable of doing good works, whether they believe it or not. And then... He delivered the unlikely and unexpected when he included atheists among those who are redeemed by Christ. And he invited them to do good works. I'm thinking what should surprise us It's not that unlikely and unexpected people demonstrate faith and do good works. What should surprise us is that we have the audacity to consider others unlikely and unexpected in the first place. You see, the centurion saw in Jesus what the most faithful Jews could not see. 
And Jesus saw in the centurion beyond what the most faithful Jews could see. I'm thinking also of others in our day whose conversions were judged as unlikely and unexpected. You may or, or may not be aware of some of these. Brian Welch. Brian Welch is the former guitarist for the rock band Korn. For years, he quietly endured the discomfort of his band's lifestyle. He separated from the band, and two weeks after announcing that, he was baptized in the Jordan River in Israel. He's quoted as saying, it's not about religion. It's not about this or that church. It's not about me. It's about the book of life. And everybody needs to be taught this. How unexpected. Perhaps David Berkowitz, also known as the son of Sam. In 1976 and 77, he went on a killing spree, taking the life of six people and wounding seven others. His consecutive sentences on all six counts meant he would be imprisoned until the year 2342. In 1989, he converted in a complete about face from Satanism to Christianity. I want you to taste the goodness of God in my life, he said, to show you that Jesus Christ is about forgiveness, hope, and change. The least expected, the most unlikely. Well, it brings me to an observation and a couple of questions. First, this observation. My hunch is almost every person here knows and loves someone who doesn't go to church, who isn't particularly strong in their faith, or who may not be even a believer at all. We've all got family members and friends whose relationship with the church is sketchy at best. And about the only thing they hear from some sectors of the church is because they're not like this or that kind of Christian. They're going to hell. I think it's time that folks heard a different message from God's church. I think it's time that they begin to hear a message that proclaims unashamedly that all are loved by God and that all means all. That we truly do believe that within every person there is the capacity to do good. That even the most unlikely or unexpected person can demonstrate a faith that even Jesus would commend. That God has sheep of other folds. People who live in ways far unto us but show us what it means to love our neighbor as ourselves. That God's grace extends to those we least expect and even to those we prefer it did not. How unlikely. How unexpected. I wonder if that's what Jesus was getting at when he said tax collectors and prostitutes will make it into the kingdom before the religious elite. And finally, the question. Might we pray for these folks? Might we even pray a prayer of thanksgiving that they're in our lives? That God would use them to do good in the world even if they wouldn't call it that. That we would have the grace and courage to commend their good works and that we would share with them our gratitude for allowing God to love and live through them. And could we pray one more prayer? That God would continue to use people, even those we've decided 
are unexpected or unlikely to do wonderful things and that we might be less and less surprised. Could we pray that God would open our hearts and our eyes to see just how far God's love, His will, and His works extend beyond the confines of this church and through people we least expect it. And that God, the God who showed up in an unlikely centurion, will regularly show up where and in whom we least expect it. I challenge each of us this week to, as we go about our days, to identify those people who previously we may have thought as unlikely or unexpected to be people of faith or to exhibit faith. And I think if we can, and we offer these prayers, and we live into these prayers, we could reach people with a lasting message. A message of hope, of faith, and of love. And that, my friends, would be really good news. And the world needs good news, even if it's unexpected. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.